Hello, everybody. Day four of reInvent. How are you guys all doing? Good. I uh, want to make sure you're here for the right top topic. This is EC2 Foundations. Uh, my name is Raj Pai. I lead the product management team for EC2. This is my fourth reInvent as an employee, but it's my first time giving this uh, particular talk. So I wanted to get a, a little bit of a baseline, because we have a wide variety of folks who come to these talks. Uh, how many of you are new to the cloud? Uh, you've heard about EC2, but you're, you're here just to learn more about what it is and how it works? Few of you, OK. Uh, how many of you have actually spun up an EC2 server, maybe for some dev tests, uh, but you want to know more about the breadth of offerings? Awesome. OK, cool. And then how many of you um, use EC2 in production? Uh, you've been using it. You want to know what's new, what's changed in the last year? All right. OK, so we have a pretty good uh, variety here. Uh, I'm going to try to meet everyone's needs as much as I can. Uh, but I will start from the beginning. So these are the topics we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about ECT resources. This includes instances, the storage, and networking that go with them. Uh, we're going to talk about how we design our infrastructure for availability and tips and tricks that you can take advantage of to design your apps for higher resiliency, including some of the new features that we've introduced um, even this week. Uh, as your fleets grow, uh, you, need, you have more sophisticated needs around management. And we'll tell you about some of the best practices uh, in, around managing your EC2 infrastructure. And finally, uh, I'm going to spend some time on how to optimize your spend on EC2. So that's how we're going to go. We'll go back to the slide a few times just so you know where we are in the presentation. Don't worry, we're going to spend a lot of time on the first part uh, and a little less on the other parts because it really is the heart of this story. We're going to start with the EC2 instance. So what is an EC2 instance? So as you probably could guess, we have racks of servers all over the world, lots, a lot of data centers, lots of AZs across lots of regions. Each rack has hosts, physical hosts, that run hypervisors, which essentially carve up the servers into virtual machines. Now, each virtual machine has uh, some CPU, some memory, some storage, some network capability. Um, and we call these virtual machines in EC2 language the EC2 instances. So instances are really virtual servers in the cloud or virtual machines in the cloud. So 11 years ago, that's, that's, EC2 was one of the first AWS services, not the first, but one of the first. We had a couple goals in mind. We wanted to create compute as a service that you can scale up or down quickly as needed. And we wanted to enable customers to pay for what they use instead of making these large upfront investments in capital expenditures and data centers. And also, we had an idea that there's going to be a compute unit. We just called it the EC2 instance. It had one vCPU, 1 1.7 uh, gigs of memory. I thought this was a good form factor for the majority of workloads at the time. So the, the first two principles still hold true just as much as they did back then. Uh, we want to have elasticity. We want to have a utility-based uh, billing and consumption model. But customers, once they started using it, they loved it. And they told us, hey, we want to move more and more of our workloads to the cloud. But one size doesn't fit all. And uh, we have a lot of unique needs to get these workloads off our on-premises infrastructure to your cloud. And we've been working furiously to meet those needs. Over the last 10 years, we've gone from one instance in 2006 to over 70 different instance types uh, as of this week. Actually, over 70, I think. So when I talk about instance types, what am I talking about? Because I've, I've already introduced a bunch of, bunch of terms to you, and I think I need to go back and explain them for a second. So I mentioned before that the hypervisor carves up a host in, with CPU, memory, storage, and some set of network capabilities. Well, it turns out different workloads need different ratios of these capabilities. Some workloads need a lot of CPU. Uh, you know, they, they do things like analytics. They do things like rendering. Some workloads need a lot of memory, things like that use in-memory databases. Um, there's workloads that require a lot of I.O. transactions to local high-performance disk. Well, each instance family represents one of those workloads and a ratio of these resources. On the right, you'll see a phrase, i3.extra-large. That's the API name of one of our resources. The i3 instance, which is our I, stands for I.O. optimized. 
It's an instance that has a significant amount of SSD NVMe disk. The three is a generation number or a version number. So as we introduce new capabilities with new hardware revisions, new chipsets, new memory and, and storage technologies, we increment this version number. I3 is the latest generation. And that extra large, that's what we call a size or a t-shirt size. So all the sizes have the same ratio of resources, but the bigger ones have more of them, starting from small, medium, large, extra large, two extra large, and so on. A two extra large i3 would have twice as much CPU, twice as much memory, and twice as much storage as i3 that extra large. That's the difference. Same ratio, just different amounts as you scale up your workloads. So what runs on these instances? We have what we call Amazon machine images, which to a large extent is, defines the software and some of the initial configuration of those instances. When I say software, what I mean is the OS, the application, if you want to have an application package that's pre-installed, and some of the configuration that goes and runs uh, as on these VMs. We have Amazon maintained images, which are a set of most of the commonly used Linux and Windows images that we keep up to date and have available in each region. And the community maintains a ton of these. Um, they expose them publicly. We have marketplace partners that have these along with licensing and, and pricing for those licensing on our AWS marketplace. And you can make your own. You can start with one of the Amazon ones, one of the community ones, make your own modifications, or you can import it from on-premise. You can share these across your accounts, or you can keep it private to your account depending on what your needs are. And this slide, uh, I love putting this up. We're gonna, we're gonna talk a, a little bit about each of these instance families in a second, but this re represents the spectrum of our instance families. And what I like about this slide is every instance with a new over it is something we've introduced in the last year, since the last reInvent. So we're constantly have new generations of instances, introducing new instance families, new capabilities. And some of these, T2 Unlimited, M5, I think uh, H1, uh, uh, and bare metal, which we're going to talk about, all we announced in the last two days. So that's kind of the pace that we're going at. So let's start with workloads, because we tend to start with workloads and work back to the instances that meet those needs. So a good place to start is general purpose workloads. These are things like your web servers, your app servers, enterprise apps. They need a good balance of CPU to memory. And a good place to start is our M series of instances, or M family. And we just introduced the latest generation M. M can stand for mainstream or multipurpose. We just introduced our latest generation uh, a couple of days ago, I think on Tuesday night, uh, with the M5. This introduces Intel's latest uh, Intel Xeon scalable processors, or codenamed Skylake, as you might have heard about them and introduces a new largest instance size, the M524 Extra Large, which has 96 vCPUs and 384 gigs of memory. Now compare that to the M1, which was the first instantiation of this family, which had one vCPU and about two gigs of memory. We've come a long way since the beginning. But we also have smaller t-shirt sizes of these instances for those workloads that don't need quite as many resources, but still need the four to one memory to vCPU ratio. That's really common with these general purpose workloads. We have up to 25 gigabits of networking on the largest size, and the smaller sizes have up to 10 gigabits of networking on those sizes. And we introduce Intel's AVX512 uh, um, vector extensions, which are part of the Skylake architecture, which enables you to double your per performance on certain vector and floating point based workloads. So when we actually look at the use of our general purpose instances across the fleet, we notice something. Turns out that they're not very busy. Turns out, if you look at this chart, the left-hand side represents 0% CPU utilization, and the right-hand side represents 100%. Well, most of our instances are somewhere in the 0 to 20 or 30% CPU utilization. They're not busy, they're not busy, and then there's gonna be a whole bunch of web requests and they spike a little bit, but on average, this is where we see them. And on the right-hand side, you have your Bitcoin miners. Or, you know, and there's legitimate workloads there too, but I mean, what you'll really see is um, kind of a, 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 a distribution where the majority is on the low end. 
So this was an opportunity for us to go and how do we find a way to take advantage of this by overselling or oversubscribing our instances and passing along those savings to customers. And we did this with the T family, the latest generation being T2, general purpose burstable instances. So the T family uh, supports a baseline level of CPU with the ability to burst above the baseline to full core. Uh, it can range from 5% of baseline perf of one CPU to 135% of one CPU in a T2, two extra large that has eight vCPUs. So originally we only had three of these sizes, but there's such demand because these are the lowest cost instances that we kept on expanding the range. Customers love these because for most of their workloads, well over 95%, they see the full cores all the time. But there's been one adoption blockers. Customers love this, but they know that if they're running over the baseline for too long, on average, over 24 hour period, if they're running over the baseline, we'll throttle them back down. And they're worried that what happens if I get throttled down at the least opportune moment, when I'm having a flash sale, when I have a lot of requests. So to address this, we just introduced yesterday a new capability called T2 Unlimited. This lets you burst whenever you want for as long as you want. Now at the end of the day, if your uh, baseline performance average to be under what is provisioned with the instance, you're fine, you're good. And you know, almost all the time that'll be the case. But in that blue moon, in that rare occasion where your baseline is above, we'll charge you a small true up. So this is new as of this week. And we expect this will enable a lot of great adoption of T2. We already have great adoption. I think this will really unblock folks to use these. Our memory optimized instances. Um, I, we talked about the four to one ratio of M instances of memory to CPU. Our memory optimized, our instances have an eight to one ratio. And this is ideal for things like in-memory databases, in-memory caches, in-memory analytics. Um, they also support uh, 25 gigabits of network bandwidth and have up to half a terabyte of memory. And they have smaller sizes that have the same ratio with you know, as low as 15 gigs of memory. These are very popular for these sort of workloads. But one of the pieces of feedback we got was we have even larger data sets. What about your SAP HANA databases that are sitting on premise? How do we bring those to your cloud? What about your Apache databases? What about my in-memory caches? Well, for those, we introduced some additional families, starting with the X1 that we launched last year that has up to two terabytes of memory and 128 vCPUs. And these are ideal for those scale-up memory workloads that you can't refactor necessarily because they're built on technology that needs to scale up, but you want to move it to the cloud. Well, as soon as we shipped these, these are super popular, the customer said, hey, I'm at one or one and a half terabytes now, but I know in a year or two I'm gonna be higher. I'm a little nervous about moving to the cloud unless I know that you guys are gonna grow with me. So we did two things. One, we introduced a four ter terabyte option with the X1E that has a 32 to one memory to vCPU ratio. And two, we talked about our roadmap to our customers. In the next year, we're planning on introducing high memory instances with up to 16 terabytes of memory. So that really kind of unblocks adoption here because people know that as they grow, we're gonna grow and we're gonna be there for them with these large in-memory data sets. So we talked about memory, we talked about general purpose. What about storage? So there's really two flavors of storage. There's high performance, high IO SSD storage, and there's um, high throughput um, magnetic storage. So let's talk about IO optimized instances, or I3s. These are ideal for high performance databases, real time analytics, transactional workloads. Um, they offer really high random IOs, 3.3 million IOPS. This is nine times what we offered in our last generation I2s. And we're yet to find a lot of workloads that don't artificially um, take advantage of all these IOPS. So this has been a really popular instance. Um, I'm also excited to say this is the first instance where we've introduced a new option for our, um, for our EC2 instance family, which is EC2 bare metal instances. And we announced these uh, a couple days ago. Over the last several years, we've been working on offloading more and more of what a hypervisor does to hardware offloads that sit inside the host, but don't utilize any of the CPU or memory on the host. And we've kind of, we finally have culminated that journey 
with the latest generations of instances where all the network, software-defined networking, the packet processing, the EBS uh, management, the encryption that we do, doesn't run on the CPUs, it runs on hardware offload. So we can give you all the CPUs and all the memory on a box. What that also means is that the hypervisor now becomes optional. What that also means is you could bring your own hypervisor, or you don't have to run a hypervisor at all. So we've introduced this on the i3 uh, first, but it'll expand to other families as we introduce them. Uh, we have an i3 metal offering uh, that you can bring your own hypervisor. You could bring OSs that can't run in a virtualized environment or applications that can't run in a virtualized environment because of licensing restrictions. And we're really excited to see how customers will use these moving forward. These are the foundational building block behind the VMware Cloud for, on AWS offering that we GA'd earlier this year and just add a whole bunch of new capabilities to this week in partnership with the VMware team. So I also talked about storage optimized workloads that need a lot of disk. And for these workloads, we have the D2 offering. This offers the lowest cost storage per gigabyte disk because it's using magnetic storage. For workloads that don't necessarily need all the IOs per second, but they require high sequential disk throughput. And these are things like HCFS, data warehousing, and log processing. Since we introduced these, there have been a lot of new workloads that have come to the cloud, things like big data, things like MapReduce. And these customers have told us, this is great. This is a great offering. But you know what? Like, I don't quite need 48 terabytes at that ratio. I actually need a little bit more uh, vCPU for the amount of disk I have and a little bit more memory for the amount of disk I have. So to address those use cases, this week we just shipped a new instance family, the H1. So the H1 has about the same amount of memory, but it has twice as many vCPUs, and it has a third the amount of storage. What this means is for workloads like Kafka and MapReduce and big data workloads, they get lower costs, because they don't need the 48 terabytes. They need a little bit less, and they like the fact that we have a lot more CPU and memory available for the processing aspects of those workloads. So I'm really excited that we keep on broadening our offerings in response to customer demands as new workloads become popular uh, to bring to the cloud. So on to the workhorses of EC2, our compute-intensive workloads. These are things, scenarios like HPC, encoding, batch processing. And for these, we just introduced our latest generation compute optimized instances earlier this month with a C5. Similar to the M5, these use Intel's latest Skylake processors, but we worked with them to custom fabricate a Skylake chip that has extremely high performance for these workloads with a, a three gigahertz frequency part. These support 72 vCPUs and 144 gigs of memory, which provides a two to one ratio, which is ideal for computer intensive workloads. Remember, M's offer four to one, R's offer eight to one, this offers two to one. So these are very compute intensive. And they also offer AVX 512, which for many companies enables them to do their inference and vector based processing much, much faster. And there's a quote here from Netflix who's able to see a significant improvement well over the 25% price performance that we advertise if you just used the core CPU alone, uh, since they're leveraging some of the AVX 512 vector extensions available with Skylake. But compute isn't just about CPUs anymore. There's been a real trend in the industry with both machine learning and HPC to get more and more done faster. And the best way to to kind of talk about this is in terms of a metaphor. Think about a, a jet plane, a business jet. It can carry 15 or 30 passengers, super agile, get them from point A to B as fast as possible. It's very similar to a CPU. Whereas on the right-hand side, you see a Shinkansen or a bullet train, right? Where you can have thousands of passengers from point A to B. It's not as fast as a jet plane, but if you're trying to deliver as many passengers as possible from one place to another, a bullet train will win every day of the week. And that's really similar to the way we think about CPUs and accelerators like GPUs and what are known as FPGAs or field programmable gate arrays. CPUs are fundamentally limited 
by the number of cores you can put on a die and the number of ALUs, or arithmetic logic units, you can put on a core. Whereas GPUs can have thousands of cores. You know, a typical GPU nowadays can have 5,000 cores. You can have eight of them on a, uh, in, a, in a single machine. And an FPGA can have millions and millions of programmable logic cells. So you can do things in parallel that you could never do before uh, with a CPU, or would take a lot of time with a CPU. So we're leading the industry in our adoption and, uh, and availability of accelerated compute. There's a lot of scenarios that leverage accelerated compute. One, the obvious one that a lot of people think about when they think about GPUs is graphics. So earlier this year, we introduced the G3 instance. So these are ideal for uh, doing multiple uh, millions of operations on pixels at, at any given time, which is well suited for scenarios like rendering or cloud workstations or video encoding. Um, a, a use case that Halliburton came to us with uh, that they said they could never achieve before they were able to use G3 was seismic exploration. They used G3s to do uh, 3D rendering of their uh, data for, for seismic ex exploration and modeling for when they do oil and gas discovery. And so uh, these are used for a lot of use cases in the industry around high-speed rendering, high-speed encoding, and virtual reality. This year, we also introduced the idea and product called Elastic GPUs. So sometimes you don't need a G3. Sometimes you don't need a dedicated box with high-powered GPUs. Sometimes you need just a little bit of GPU. Your host um, could be something like an X1, or an R4, or a C5, or an M5. And you may have part of your workload that needs to do a little bit of rendering. So what we enable you to do with Elastic GPUs is attach a GPU. You choose your size, just like you would attach an EBS volume over the network. And then we, we manage remoting your GPU calls to that GPU. We only charge you for the size that you ask for. And we're able to do this in a way that's highly compatible with your existing graphics app, because we use standard graphics drivers. We're OpenGL compliant. So this has been really popular for those workloads that need to do a little bit of rendering, but most of the work they do is something else. Take your choice of instance, add a GPU, use that GPU where you need it, and don't pay for any more than what you need. But as many of you know, GPUs aren't just about graphics. For many, many years, GPUs have been trending up for doing compute, general purpose compute. GPUs are used extensively for machine learning, for training, for inference, for natural language processing, for autonomous vehicle systems, and for high-performance computing, fluid dynamics, analytics, weather simulation, computational chemistry. These are all scenarios that have become extremely common and actually super critical for businesses to take advantage of the newest innovations that are coming out in the industry. And for these, we have the powerhouse instance, the P3 that we just introduced earlier this month, or actually in October. Um, this is the industry's most powerful GPU-based platform. It's based on NVIDIA's latest Tesla V100, which has up to 14 times the performance for inference and machine learning use cases as the previous generation P2 that we offered. This offers one petaplop petaflop of computational performance in a single instance. So these are used extensively for inference, for training, and for HPC use cases, um, both that are single precision and half precision, and 32-bit uh, use cases. And earlier this year, we introduced the first cloud instance that offers FPGAs, or Field Programmable Gate Arrays. What this allows a customer to do is take their algorithm and bake it onto their hardware. So it can offer orders of magnitude performance over what you can do in any CPU. There's, you can have custom data widths. You don't have, you're not stuck to 16 or 32 or 64-bit. You can have 7-bit. 
You have custom operations. And you can program these yourself. But you may not even know what an FPGA is. You can take advantage of FPGAs, FPGAs because we've made these available on our marketplace so any partner or any customer can go and build an FPGA image that takes a particular task, like compression or encryption or transcoding, build an acceleration to support it using our tools, our hardware development kits, package it up as an image, and make it available on the marketplace. So you as a consumer just need to select that image, load it up on an F1, and away you go. Your workload could run 30 or 50 or 100 times faster. That's the power that comes with F1 and the ecosystem around it. And just last month, we, ha we have examples of real-world use cases that take advantage of the F1. Uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and Etico Genome just broke the world record in how many genomes can be processed in a period of time by using 1,000 F1 instances to process 1,000 genomes si simultaneously in two hours and 23 minutes. So it's great to see how the technology we're bringing is solving real-world problems. So that's kind of a broad overview of our instance families. But EC2 is not just about the instances. It's about the resources that you have to use in conjunction with your, with your instances. And the most common one that we've, we usually talk about is storage. So I mentioned before, many of our instances have instance storage. These are the, the Ds, the Is. Some of our other instances have local storage. We have SSD and, HG, and, and magnetic variants. And these are local to your instance, and they're non-persistent by default. The data is not replicated by default. And we don't support backup by default. These are all things that you as a customer, if you're using local storage, will do on top, just like you would if you had local storage on your laptop or your desktop or your server in your data center. Uh, but there are lots of use cases that like local storage. Uh, and, and I mentioned a few of those earlier. But most of our customers actually use block storage as a service, our EBS offering, Elastic Block Store. So with EBS, you're able to create and attach volumes through an API. And these volumes are logical. What, what I mean by that is you see a, that red box, the EBS volume on the screen. That's not one disk. That's actually many, many disks under the covers that are replicated so we can have extremely high durability and extremely high performance. And that's exposed to you as one logical volume. And you can choose how much disk you want for a particular workload, depending on your needs. You're not tied to whatever's available on the local storage. You can choose how much you want and what type of volumes you want. We have a variety of different types of volumes. We have uh, different flavors of SSD. Uh, general purpose SSDs, which offer high performance at a low cost, or you could provision the numbers of IOs per second you need with our IO1 or provision IOPS volumes. We have different flavors of magnetic volumes. We have throughput optimized ST1 volumes, and we have cold storage ST1 volumes for even lower costs for magnetic disk. And EBS volumes can be snapshotted. So what that means is we actually copy every block on the first snapshot to S3, where we can store it at low cost. And then subsequently, if you make a, a snapshot, we only take the blocks that have changed and persist them to S3 to further lower your costs. So EBS is a great way for you to have the flexibility you need with your storage. And just this year, since last year reInvent, we've introduced elastic volumes which lets you dynamically increase your volume size, increase the performance of your volumes, or change your volume types without any disruption to your service. So we've made this option even more flexible to our customers using EC2 with EBS. Now let's talk about networking. So uh, many of you probably have heard about VPC or virtual private cloud. Virtual private cloud is a logically isolated cloud where you can launch, launch AWS resources into a virtual network. It's your area of the AWS cloud. And this contains um, some of the, the fundamental technologies that you'd expect to see in a virtual network. Things like security groups, which, tell, which specify what instances could talk to what instances. Uh, things like ACLs, which tell you what sub, 
subnetworks or subnets within a VPC can talk to what subnets or are, are addressable from outside the VPC and by the internet. For subnets that are uh, uh, set up as private subnets, all the instances in them have private IPs. So we have NAT gateways, which will enable us to map a public IP to those private IPs when you make a response to the internet, or make a request to the internet, and then as we get responses back, we can map those back from the public IP to the private IP within your subnet. We have the notion of flow logs, which essentially look at the traffic flows on each of our network interfaces, your subnets, your VPCs, and then are able to log those to CloudWatch. So you can see the requests, the traffic that was accepted and that was declined and have a high level monitoring and security uh, over your, your traffic. And all this is accessible uh, even from on-premise with direct connect and hardware VPNs. So you can essentially make Amazon's network a, a logical extension of your on-premise network for hybrid deployments. So what are some of the, the features within VPC? So one, we've supported for a while the idea of VPC peering. That lets you take a VPC in one account or multiple VPCs in one account and have instances communicate across those VPCs or across to a VPC in another account uh, using the private IP address of those instances and conforming to your requirements around security groups. One of the big feature asks we've got is, that's great that my VPCs can talk to each other, my instances can talk to each other across VPCs, but can I do that across regions too? Just last night, just yesterday, we introduced inter-region peering. So an instance in one VPC, in one AZ, in one region, can connect to the private IP of an instance in a VPC in an entirely different region with all that traffic going over the Amazon backbone. And yesterday, we introduced a brand new concept that makes connectivity across VPCs even easier, AWS Private Link for customer and partner services. So you may have heard the idea of endpoints. We introduced those earlier last year, uh, and initially for S3, where you can have an endpoint to S3 from EC2 such that all your traffic to S3 goes over the private network. Well, that's been extremely popular. Over half of the traffic to S3 from EC2 occurs via endpoints today. So a few weeks ago, we extended that with a technology called AWS Private Link for AWS Services, which allows other AWS services to have endpoints in your VPC so you can communicate over those endpoints to those services. Well, yesterday, we extended this even further. Now, any VPC can have an endpoint to any other VPC. So there's a couple real common use cases to this. One is if I have multiple accounts as an organization, I have microservices, I like to divide those up, I have a payroll system, I have an accounting system, I have a data warehouse, I can have those in different accounts set up endpoints to those accounts from the VPCs that need them and de decide which VPCs can and can't access that and ensure that all of this goes over the private network without setting up really complicated VPC peering relationships. This is a lot easier to manage versus a full mesh. But another super exciting use case is the SaaS partner scenario. So now any partner can go and have an endpoint to their service dropped into a customer's VPC. A partner like Snowflake or Expedia or AppDynamics or Heroku can say, hey, I'm going to support private link. So as a customer, you can have an endpoint to my service so that all your traffic to my service goes over Amazon's network. This has been super exciting to our partner ecosystem because this is one of the most popular asks they get from their customers. They, the customers want to use their services, but they have compliance or regulatory requirements such that they can't communicate over the private network. And now they can with Private Link. Super excited about this. So to recap this section, we talked about AMIs, which are, which are images that uh, declare what you want to run on uh, particular instances. 
We talked about instances, which are our virtual servers in the cloud that can be running or stopped virtual machines. We talked about VPCs, which is the logically isolated segment of AWS's network where you launch your instances. We talked about EBS, which is block storage as a service. So you could add storage to each of your instances and access that, access that securely with high performance, high durability. We talked about EBS snapshots, which lets you take your EBS volumes and back them up very simply and with low cost on S3. Now let's talk a little bit more about how you design your systems for availability and high resiliency. And first, I want to talk about regions and availability zones, or AZs. Because when we talk about regions, it's quite different than what other cloud providers mean when they say regions. For us, a region is a really big concept. A region is a cluster of availability zones where the availability zones are often miles apart. They each have different power infrastructure and networking. They live on different fault domains. And each availability zone consists often of multiple data centers with hundreds of thousands of servers, which is often more than typically you'll hear existing in a region of another provider. So these are really big concepts uh, when we talk about our regions and our availability zones. We have 16 regions. We're expanding. We've announced plans to expand to six more. And we have 44 availability zones across the world with plans to expand to 17 more. Because of the architecture and isolation that we have across our regions and across our availability zones, we're able to provide an SLA of 99.99%. We actually just upped that from 99.95% in the last several weeks. But there's things that you can do as well. In addition to our highly available infrastructure, there's things that you can do to make your apps more resilient to failure. So you may know about placement groups. So placement groups are a mechanism that historically have been used for you to place your instances close together on the same physical host, or as close as possible to being on the same physical host, to minimize the latency, maximize the throughput between instances for HPC and those sort of scenarios. Um, we've supported those for a long time. Just this week, we announced the idea of spread placement groups. What spread placement groups let you do is have your instances live on different pieces of hardware to help reduce the chance of correlated failure. So what is the scenario for spread placement groups? Well, imagine a NoSQL database cluster in EC2. Spread placement will ensure that instances in your cluster live on distinct hardware, helping insulate a single hardware failure to a single zone. And this is just a parameter that you specify in your run instances call. You say placement equals spread, or placement equals cluster, depending on whether, or I'm sorry, placement strategy equals spread, or strategy equals cluster, depending on how you want your instances to be placed, either close together to minimize latency or far apart to have less chance of correlated failure. Another tool that most of our customers use uh, to ensure high resiliency is elastic load balancing. Elastic load balancing is used to route incoming requests to multiple EC2 instances, containers, or IP addresses. And these span availability zones. So what, ha what that means is that when you have an elastic load balancer, you can have instances living across availability zones, such that if you have a failure in one availability zone, traffic automatically switches over to the other one, ensuring that your app keeps on running an active-active configuration with no disruption to your end customers. ELBs, or elastic load balancers, work in conjunction with auto-scaling. So auto-scaling uh, is a concept in, in AWS that automatically scales your instances as you need to. And there's really two scenarios here. One is called for fleet management. So if you look at the diagram to the right, you have an elastic load balancer with several instances underneath it. Let's say one of those instances fails or goes down. Well, the ELB will then see that the health check on that instance failed. 
and then it will automatically bring up a new instance within that auto scaling group to take its place. The other scenario is what we call dynamic scaling, where you can use auto scaling to scale to the demand of your uh, workload. So with dynamic scaling, in an auto scaling group, you could have several instances, and you can have policies that look at metrics like CPU utilization. So as my CPU utilization goes up, the auto scaling service sees that and automatically provisions new instances with the same AMIs, AMIs, machine images, to scale to the load that your servers are seeing. So th this is how you can leverage auto scaling with load balancing to increase the resilience of your site and scale to your demand of your customers. So as your fleets of instances get more sophisticated, you're not always gonna have just one instance running that you have to manage. You may have hundreds or thousands, or many of our customers now have tens of thousands of instances. How do you manage those instances at scale? So you know, in the beginning, when you're launching an instance, you have to specify a lot of parameters, instance type, EBS volume, AMIs, sizes, network interfaces, tags. There's a lot that you have to think about because we have a very rich set of offerings. Uh, you input those into either the console or you make a command line call with the CLI or you use an API, our SDK, to pass those along and then we launch those instances. Well, this week we introduced a new concept called a launch template where you can encapsulate all those parameters into an EC2 resource where you can make you can specify which ones you want, which ones are optional, which ones you let your users override, so you can have one standard way of launching your instances. And one of the cool things about launch templates is that you can permission those. So you can say that your users within your company could only launch using a certain set of launch templates or could only override certain fields, which allows you to control costs, it allows you to meet your criteria around governance and best practices, and ultimately leads to higher productivity. You can version these instances so that when you have a new AMI, let's say, that has the latest patches and security updates, now all of a sudden, all the launches uh, that look at the AMI pick up the latest one. Or not, it's really up to you, but you can control that in a launch template. So great productivity feature as the needs of our customers become more sophisticated. Another kind of best practice or pro tip is using Amazon CloudWatch. So instead of running your own monitoring services over your EC2 infrastructure, we provide a very rich set of capabilities with CloudWatch, which monitors AWS resources, collects and tracks metrics, uh, log files, sets alarms, and lets you react to those alarms and mitigate issues before they become uh, issues that your customers see. So I really encourage you all to use CloudWatch uh, track your metrics, set alarms, so you can always be in tune with the health of your workloads. And just last year, we introduced EC2 Systems Manager. So a lot of customers coming from the on-premises world have lots of capabilities on-premise that let them patch their instances. What happens when you do Patch Tuesday? How do you make sure your services aren't disrupted? What about daily tasks that you have to do? What about making sure you don't have config drift on your instances. Well, now you can do all that in the cloud, in a cloud-native way with EC2 Systems Manager. So this has been super popular with our enterprise customers as they look for the cloud-native ways to accomplish a lot of the management tasks that they typically have done on-premise with a variety of different tools. How do they do that with EC2 infrastructure? And we have a great set of offerings there with EC2 Systems Manager. And just yesterday, we introduced a new service for, that's especially useful for distributed systems. So many distributed systems, it's super important for the instances within them to have a shared understanding of what time is it. And up till this week, you had to use uh, public services or roll your own to know what time it is. Well, uh, with the introduction of Amazon TimeSync service, we built a highly reliable service with satellite-connected atomic clocks that live in every region that are immediately accessible for any instance within your VPC free of charge. 
So these are available now, and uh, we encourage you to take advantage of these. They're delivered over NTP, uh, which is a commonly reused time protocol, and we think that this will really help you manage your systems, especially as you scale. So finally, we're going to talk about purchase options. And I, I highly encourage you, if you didn't catch Joshua Burgeon's session on optimizing EC2 um, uh, for profit and big savings, I think that was his catch line, that you catch that on YouTube. I believe it's already there, because uh, he goes into this in a lot of detail. But I'm going to cover some of the highlights on how you should think about purchasing EC2 capacity. So there's really three main purchasing options for EC2. On demand, which is pretty simple. You, you buy what you use. You pay for the time that it's running. Uh, just uh, in the last few months, we moved from hourly granularity billing to per second billing for EC2 Linux instances. So you're paying for the second for what you use. And this is especially well suited for workloads that are spiky or when you're just getting started on EC2 and you don't know what your baseline usage is going to be. But we found that as customers start using EC2, they know what their baseline performance is going to be. They have workloads that are like database workloads or mission critical workloads that are always running. And for those, we have options that let you get a significant discount in exchange for commitment with our reserved instances. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. And finally, we have a lot of excess capacity at any given time. And we have an option that gives you that excess capacity at industry-leading prices, over up to 90% off the on-demand price with our spot offering. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So let's talk first about reserve pricing. So with a one- or three-year commitment, you can get a significant discount off the on-demand price. With a three-year commitment, that discount approaches 75% the on-demand price. So this is great for workloads that are running 24-7, but even for those that aren't, the break-even point is actually pretty good uh, for uh, given the amount of discount that we provide. Um, but like you'd expect, these are great for steady state and committed usage. And we offer a number of different payment options. You can pay all of it up front for a slight discount, some of it up front, or you can pay month to month for your, uh, your commitment. So one of the interesting th pieces of feedback we've gotten is that historically reserved instances gave you two benefits. It gave you a capacity reservation, and it gave you a discount. But many of our customers say, hey, you know what? Capacity reservation is great, but the reason we buy these is for the discount. We'd love it if you can make the discount more flexible. And so we said, great. If you're willing to waive your capacity reservation, we'll let your discount float across AZs in the region, because we no longer have to hold the machine for you, and across instance sizes. So a reservation that previously covered uh, uh, a C4 8XL can now cover four C4 2XLs automatically. And we'll just do that on your behalf. So you have the ability to opt out of the capacity reservation to get more flexibility on your existing reserved instances. We also introduced a concept called convertible RIs. And with convertible RIs, you can change the instance family or the OS or the tenancy or the payment model at any time during the term. Uh, historically, we've offered these with three-year terms. But just a couple weeks ago, we now have introduced a one-year convertible RI due to popular, popular demand. So um, this kind of represents a lot of the uh, ways that we're able to pass along our cost savings when you're able to commit to um, our instance families. So you may wonder, like, how do I know how much RIs to buy? I mean, I can eyeball it based on my bill, but can you provide me a better way? So in the last couple of weeks, we introduced reserved instance recommendations in our Cost Explorer tool. So what this does is it looks at your last 30 days of usage, looks at how you've utilized your EC2 resources, and makes recommendations depending on whether you want to make a one or three year commitment or what type of RI you want to uh, purchase it makes you a recommendation of what you should buy and how much money that will save you. Now, obviously, this is a very large customer. This is actually customer, this is actual customer data uh, for a large customer. But um, you'll be able to use this for any size account to determine what the right RI amount is to maximize your savings. Let me talk a minute about Spot. So like I mentioned before, Spot is a capability and a purchasing option that lets you take advantage 
of the excess capacity that we have uh, by purchasing it at a significant discount, up to 90% off the on-demand price. Now the catch is, we will be able to reclaim that capacity by giving you a, a two-minute warning uh, when we start using that capacity during peak times. But many of our customers use Spot for those workloads they otherwise probably wouldn't want to pay for with on-demand pricing. Like, what if I? What, how much is that 20th or 30th or 40th simulation worth to me? Well, it might be worth it if I'm only paying 10% of the on-demand cost. And we have a new capability that we introduced last year, uh, uh, last couple of years, called Spot Fleet. That it's essentially a management experience for Spot where you can specify how much capacity you want, and Spot Fleet will uh, manage getting you that capacity across our fleet. So this week, we've introduced several improvements to Spot. One is that we've introduced much more predictable pricing. Before, customers would see the, the Spot price uh, spike and fall depending on customer demand, but we've really smoothed that out so you can have a good assurance that you'll get between a 70 and 90% discount on the spot capacity requests you make. And because of that, we no longer require you to bid on spot capacity. Uh, you can just say, hey, I want a spot instance, and we will give it to you, and you'll know, and your finance person will know that you're getting a great deal on it because we have much more predictable pricing with our new pricing model. Second, we've integrated the spot uh, acquisition experience into the Run Instances API, which is the, the same API that you use to run on-demand or reserved instances. You just pass one additional mark, uh, parameter, the market parameter, and we will provision you spot capacity at the current rate uh, um, if it's available, uh, without having to learn a whole new set of tools and a whole new set of uh, capabilities. And finally, this is the one I'm most excited about, this week, we introduced the ability to hibernate your spot instance. So this means that if you so choose, when that two minute warning comes in, we can intercept that warning, we can freeze the running state of your instance to disk, just like you would if you're shutting the lid on your laptop. And when capacity is available again, we hydrate that back into your spot instance, and it's like you never left. No one else has this capability, and it makes Spot much more accessible to a broader set of use cases. So, which one do you use? And the answer is all of the above. Most of our customers have a portfolio of purchasing options. They'll take their baseline usage and use reserved instances to get the best pricing on that. And they'll use a combination of on-demand and Spot for the remaining usage, depending on how critical that usage is. And the great thing is that whether you're using EC2 directly or using EC2 under the covers uh, uh, with ECS or um, EMR or auto scaling or AWS batch, all these purchase options just work. They're well integrated into all the systems that leverage EC2. So with that, um, I want to go ahead and kind of close. We, we talked about the resources, the wide variety of workloads that we address with EC2. We talked about how we provide high availability and the things that you could do to ensure that your apps are highly resilient. We talked about the management capabilities that you should leverage in order to make, to make the most use of uh, the automation that we provide as your fleet scale up. And we talked about how to optimize your spend on EC2. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you're having a great reInvent. I'll be available in the corner since we're running low on time, but um, I will be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.